My name is Amy Reed. I'm uh, the Chief of Vascular Surgery at the U and I also run Vascular Surgery for Fairview. And I've been in practice for 19 years. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin, but I have trained and I went to med school at uh, University of Wisconsin in undergrad and then I was out east for training and practice and um, came to University of Minnesota um, for a job recruitment just a year ago. So back, in, it's good to be back in the Midwest, albeit a different part of the Big Ten. And um, my area of, uh, of surgery is one, and uh, you know, I don't know if there's any vascular surgeons in the room, but uh, vascular surgery really, we tell people we operate on blood vessels, whether it's arteries or veins, predominantly arteries. Um, and we do that anywhere on the body, in the body, except directly in the head or on the heart. So that means we operate in sort of the neck and these arteries, the arms, the chest, um, the abdomen, the legs, so a lot of variety with that. And one of the things that I think is relevant to you guys is uh, our specialty um, really used a lot of what I kind of call, you know, knife and fork sort of surgery of really kind of what you think traditionally is you make an incision, you do things to blood vessels, and you sort of sew them together, different things. Um, and when I was a uh, resident back in the uh, early 90s, that was pretty much what a lot of our surgery sort of stuff for vascular was. And what was really cool is uh, my training, I spent five years training in surgery and then two years subspecializing in vascular surgery. And the cool thing was about uh, maybe four or five years um, into my general surgery residency, vascular surgery sort of did this amazing kind of, um, I guess had an epiphany, you know, morphed into something completely different, which is germane to what we'll talk about, but also sort of your areas. And that was really embracing what we call endovascular, or something that's dealing inside the vessels, rather than so much open surgery. And what was particularly uh, interesting about it is it, it kind of, we, a lot of us who were already out in the field, completely kind of retrained ourselves and retrained, we, we retrain our, um, what we train for our fellows and our trainees now uh, encompasses in a, this type of technique in a very, in a completely comprehensive and wide fashion. And it's just another sort of uh, technique for us. But the cool thing, it comes from your ends where uh, there's a lot of different stents. I have a couple that I'll pass around germane to these uh, cases that I'm gonna show. Uh, but there are different stents and balloons and wires and catheters and sheaths and coils and plugs and all these different things that we use in the bloodstream. And what I find fascinating after doing this for 19 years is the, the constant sort of creation and creativity of taking a patient who has a lot of medical other issues. So a lot of my patients um, will have many different types of other things going on with them. So I'm not a heart surgeon, I don't work on the heart, but a lot of my patients have heart issues and have maybe diabetes and all these other issues. So my challenge is to kind of look at that whole forest of their medical issues and try to, fig try to deal with the problem I'm handed as one of these vessel issues. And uh, I'll talk about a few of the, uh, the things that, a uh, couple cases and, and get your thoughts and show you kind of some things that we do. But um, one of the things that's happened with device is like a lot of things, um, we went from being a maximally invasive, open you up and do these things sort of surgery to how can we miniaturize things and get devices inside blood vessels and to treat the patient the, in a, to get the same type of outcome. So our goal is really to get the same type of outcomes we were getting kind of with the knife and fork sort of surgery to miniaturizing it, um, still getting great outcomes, still treating the same problems, but using devices and techniques that are, say, punctures instead of incisions, that are outpatient instead of admission to the hospital, that are maybe uh, a one-inch incision versus, in, versus a foot long. Um, so these are the sort of things that um, we look to all of your creative minds to help us with this. We think about things once in a while, and I'm sure, you know, a couple of things I'll show you, you may say, like, why don't you do it this way? Or, you know, how do you guys do that? Or how, you know, and thinking about ways um, that uh, you can help in this arena. And when our specialty kind of made these changes in the late 90s, it was transformative for us. And I would have to say, 
you know, probably 90% of our specialty got on that bus and uh, some percentage like never bought into it and thought it was just this blasphemous thing we were going to do and we were abandoning our surgery and all this sort of stuff. And, um, and I'm happy to say it's persisted and the, the device, and, and I would have to say for, for uh, cardiovascular disease, this is the, the biggest area, um, what you see a lot of um, companies uh, in device that are treating cardiovascular disease stents and different types of devices uh, for the cardiovascular system are, are some of the hottest areas that we see. The first case I'm going to start with, um, and I first just want to sort of show you, and you can kind of, this is not the hybrid room I have at the university. This was one when I was running vascular at Penn State, but it it's, epitomizes kind of the area. and. Um, I think for any of you who, even for um, ergonomics, for development, um, you know, it's, it's interesting and I just want to point out a few of the things because I started off in electrical engineering and then I went into medicine and this is like kind of nothing to do with that other than some flow dynamics, I think. But um, our, so the, the operating room has, the, has a table, but this isn't even a typical table. Um, this is a table that we have to be able to do fluoroscopy through, right, and x-ray and do all these sorts of things to get where we're going to go. And for the thoughts about the robots and different things like that, there's a lot of equipment. This is one of the most expensive operating rooms that we set up. So um, when vascular surgeons or cardiac surgeons, we come to institutions, they're all like, oh my god, do you want one of those rooms? And so we've kind of come full circle. I've built a couple of these and they're you know, uh, there are things now that some of the devices and some of the imaging are so much better. We don't always need like a super uh, room like this, but usually there's some type of ceiling mounted attached uh, C arm, we call it, or where the fluoro, the radiation comes from down here. And then the bed is one that um, is not really, as I said, the, this one actually had actually sort of floats and it moves down so we can step and look at images of uh, vessels on the legs up in the chest anywhere. So you have to be able to have this sort of float underneath. And it's kind of a nightmare for anesthesia who has to kind of make, if the patient's asleep, they usually would be sitting sort of up in here. And we have to be able to see. So the ergonomics of where the, and this is actually now, these were flat panels. Um, I'd say the flat panels we use now are about, and so I have four here, the, the one I use now is about this, this whole size. So when you think about even, and I don't know much, uh, you think about for radiation and what we look at. Some of the things when you design devices and the things we'll look at is, um, and it all is it's kind of packaging. I'll, I'll pass one of these around a little bit, but one of the stents we put in that's covered, you know, what we want and what, um, to make it easier on the patient is we want something smaller and smaller and smaller. But for those of you who deal with materials know that we gotta have integrity of the material and you got to have it last a long period of time. So these are things that are going to go, particularly for covering sorts of things, uh, where we're going to cover up openings in vessels or cover up um, aneurysms or dissections or things like that. The integrity needs to last. And we've already started to see in some of the devices, and I'll have uh, some descriptions of what we classify as leaks, where where some of the fabric and the materials will have, over time, just porosity or wear, and that develops into some of these endoleaks where there's sort of a seeping outside of the fabric. But for the radiation piece, we have to be able to kind of see it, and that all impacts for you guys on how things get packaged, because you want little something that we can see under x-ray, but you have to think about what does that add to the, the, the diameter of the device when it's constricted? What's going to happen when, you, when we uncover it and get it into the system? Is there going to be issues with where those are? And how many different things do, you, do we need? So um, there's sometimes so the orientation of the device and where that goes in. Sometimes there's long radio opaque um, markers. Sometimes there's short ones. Sometimes you'll see where we have to put things together. Um, there's different little markings. And you've got all sorts of other things you're looking at. So um, it's very important that uh, in a lot of things I'm sure you hear is the radiation and the exposure not only to the patient but to us. And that plays a lot into how we can see these sorts of things. And these are ones with coverings. I'm not going to talk too much about um, uh, disease, occlusive disease, meaning plaque, where we use just bare metal stents where we open up a passage in the vessel. Uh, but it's the same kind of thing. So I feel like there's a constant, um, you know, probably a bit of a struggle of even the wires and things that you put on the stents or you think about that, um, you know, what kind of thickness, diameter, and how is that going to impact packaging? Because it sounds sort of silly, but um, 
the biggest thing in our field is how can you get things smaller and smaller? And that, of course, impacts on fabric and integrity and visibility and all those sorts of things. And how does, is it compliant? Does it track what we call, can, it, can I navigate it around vessels and through vessels that are sort of diseased and sometimes tortuous? So that's part of the reason why um, you know, we, as we get those sort of things, we want a, you know, a bigger screen, the big screen kind of TV to look at. But then we also want to think about, you know, this C-arm um, and where that radiation kind of impact is. And uh, for those of you, I, I'm, radiation safety has been my kind of big thing in vascular surgery. And you probably know there's a lot of the scatter. Patients laying here and the scatter comes up toward us. So we have to wear a lot of, obviously, lead, but protective thyroid shield and glasses. and so. All those sort of things, you know, if we can't see your device very well and we got to mag up, we call it or magnify the view, that's more radiation um, to the patient, more to us, more scatter also because the patient will absorb some dose of radiation, but the rest of it gets scattered. And so the other thing is this arm moves. And so some images, and I'll show you some of the stents and the, thing, the, the um, things we put in, we're looking at just a two-dimensional image, right? So we're not looking really three-dimensionally too often. And so um, what we're looking at is these pictures on the screen, just like you'd be looking at a television screen, it's sort of a two-dimensional for us picture, and I'll show you those. So um, some of it is um, we're gonna have to turn this C-arm sometimes to get the right orientation of the vessel because people's vessels just don't come out flat and kind of in a nice 2D plane. And they sometimes will be curving or they'll kind of, the, the aorta, as we'll talk about more uh, quite a bit today, the aorta kind of comes, you have your heart here, and the aorta kind of comes up like a candy cane kind of backward and down. And so that means we have to angle this C-arm and um, that, again, once we start angling, that brings about a lot more radiation. So um, I don't know if any of you are in those sort of areas, but that's a lot of different things we're sort of thinking about. So when I start planning cases and think about um, what kind of um, angles do I need, there's a lot of um, computer software imaging and things that we look at to make center line measurements, to make, look at the angles, uh, and to plan it as much as possible with our image before we get started. So one of the areas I want to um, talk about, and um, while I'm talking about this, let me send around, I'll send around these two things. Um, what I'm going to send, uh, these are, uh, I don't think anybody in this room is with these companies. Um, there's two different, uh, these are just two different companies, and these are just to kind of give you some idea of the flexibility and the conformability. Um, and these are devices that I think I've had these for about a decade now, maybe not quite. Um, these are two different types of devices that we use to treat the thoracic aorta, so up in this sort of area. So um, you can kind of take a look at them, and, and we can talk about some of the different things at the top. So I'll just pass this around. So one of the things that um, we treat are aneurysms and um, dissections. And aneurysms, I'm sure many of you have heard them, of course, in the brain. But there's other aneurysms that are, can occur in um, the aorta, which is um, uh, comes, as I said, out of the heart. And it's in the heart would be right here. And this comes out of the heart into the chest. And it goes down to the legs. So there's two areas which have been heavily um, device heavy and have really kind of transformed how we operate on these patients um, in the last 15, 20 years. So uh, one of the areas that um, has become, uh, we see this more and more, and I've seen this at every place I've been at, are more issues with this type of dissection. There's been several notable people and, and comedians and celebrities and a few people who have, have had sudden death from these. And um, we're going to talk about this area where it goes down into the, starts up at, around your left arm and goes down. Um, I'm not going to talk about the ones that go around to the heart that involve not so much device. They're using grafts and open surgery to replace those. But uh, there are some things that there's a patient coming up I'll, I'll show you that we talk about for that. So one of the things. Um, with this sort of problem is it's in the chest, and um, there's different ways uh, that we can treat these. And uh, we talk about um, you know, figuring out where it comes from, that sort of, and what are the treatment options. So believe it or not, um, this tear uh, can happen. And think of it, it's like splitting an onion, 
or when you have layers of an onion, so you have layers of the blood vessel wall. And what happens is we tell patients it kind of goes from like a single barrel, kind of like a shotgun thing, and then it goes a double barrel kind of thing. And you can imagine how from the integrity of a structure that has multiple layers around the wall that if you lift up uh, the outer, the, the inner and middle layer and you send blood shooting down there, and you have blood going in the true lumen, we call it, and the false lumen, how much loss of integrity there is of this, this wall. And so believe it or not, you might think like, oh my god, of course that would need to be like stented or treated. But um, for the longest time, um, and I would say this has been driven somewhat by device, is that we would manage these really medically, meaning, um, and I just admitted a guy a week ago with this who um, came in and had some back pain, belly pain that had been going on like a day. A lot of times people come in right away. You might think they were having a heart attack. They have severe pain between the shoulder blades and kind of go into the back. Um, and came in and we got his blood pressure managed and for many, many decades, blood pressure management alone is what we did with these because many times, sometimes what will happen is this part that's false will actually close off or clot off, which is a positive remodeling where then it leaves, um, it's clots off, we're, we're saying it's positive remodeling, meaning this isn't gonna continue to get larger. We don't really know that. So, um, you know, areas about um, study about compliance and what happens to that area after it splits like that, we don't really know very well. Um, for the presentation, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, but <laughs> that works with Dr. Pfizer. Uh, the presentation that you know we've we've we were looking at is one of the ways we've started to treat these in the last decade is to stent some of these. And so you can imagine we've taken a structure. If you think about like the blood vessel and even the the graphs that we're passing are they're very sort of soft and compliant. And so what we're th putting in is a device, and even though if it seems pretty, so, you know, flexible to you, it still drastically changes the compliance of this blood vessel in that area. So one of the things that, you know, this is how rudimentary we are. <laughs> so you're like, okay, there's a tear there, let's cover that up. That seems like, you know, very simplistic, you know, and, and takes care of the problems for the patient. What it doesn't dive into is the deeper science and the issues down the road. Um, and so some of the things we're looking at is what does this cause as far as blood pressure? Because this came about from blood pressure. Typically, somebody's spike in blood pressure um, for a lot of different reasons, and it basically sheer force of that blood pressure lifts up what's called the intima or the first layer, and it splits the vessel, and it unzips it in a way. So you get this sort of these two, two sections. And so what we don't know is... Um, and this is where, you know, your areas of looking at what happens when we put this in, is this going to actually make blood pressure a little higher? We think that, well, we put this in, it covered up the tear so this doesn't maybe become an aneurysm, but you've now got this super compliant kind of soft tube going into kind of a semi-hard structure, and is that having some impact on blood pressure? Because I will tell you that when we, when we do this procedure, Still, we're treating the patient's blood pressure, and we're still, um, we still see there's blood pressure problems. So we worry what's going to happen with this. So just, and I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on this, and please feel free to raise your hand, answer, ask questions, anything along the way. But one of the things we've started to see is when this goes in, and you see that the device you pass around, one of them has the barbs on top, kind of the bare metal, and the other one ha is smooth. Um, we've, both the smooth and the barbed one, we see sometimes where we think this has actually somehow caused even a retrograde, we call it dissection, where it's gone the other way. So blood flow normally is this way, and there's been some reported cases where this goes in and you get a dissection backwards. This is disastrous. It needs emergency surgery. So those are some of the things that um, I'm gonna show you a case and uh, we'll go over some of that sort of thing. So there's a, a, you know, and if you think about, for those of you in, I don't know if anybody, I don't think anybody was here as in marketing or that type of thing, but there's a, companies of course are always like, you know, what's the, what's the real need? It's a lot of work to bring a device to market as you can imagine. Um, a lot of um, study with it, is it gonna work? Uh, how long is it gonna last? What's the integrity? Um, there we see, and this is, a, th this is actually somewhat old data, this 7,000 number was done, this is from data from now almost like a decade ago. So this is upwards now of at least 10 to 12,000. Not doubled, but it's increasing. Um, 
You know, there's still, some of dissections come from drug use, and um, sometimes there's severe hypertension sometimes, and, and one of the things we see sometimes is uh, cocaine and some of those types of drugs, which will severely elevate the blood pressure, and that we can see that as well. So this isn't an, a problem with, you know, just like a smoking, you know, older uh, male or female. This, these, we see these sometimes in 30-year-olds. So you have to think about that when you're making the devices, is how are we going to, 30-year-old blood vessels are essentially kind of soft and normal. So if we're going to bring this stent in, you know, how do we get it in there that it's not, that it's going to be small enough? Because their vessels, when you're 30 versus when you're 60, your blood vessels are, are very soft and compliant, um, and they do, sometimes don't accommodate these bigger devices, so that makes it a little tougher. Um, and so we talked about where they can, you can get some problems with perfusion, you don't get good blood flow to certain organs, um, and sometimes it can, it can rupture that false flap. Um, so we see it a little bit more in men, um, and talked about that um, the death rate's really high. So for some of these, um, you know, a good number die within the first 24 hours. So it's, a, it's an acute problem. We don't always have to use the stents acutely, but uh, something that, um, that we many times have to treat within the first day or so. And I think this is the, the kicker as we see it, and, I, and we see it interestingly almost equal number of women as men. And sometimes um, I've treated women physicians who have had this problem, and it presents differently a bit in women than in men, just like heart disease a little bit differently in women than men. And so I think it's so important we you know, really go after our emergency room physicians to help diagnose. So these are diagnosed usually on a CAT scan. And um, what will happen is we can see here just the death rate is extremely high. And so um, many of these are, are extremely um, mortal. So what we're going to do um, is talk a little bit, as we talked about, how the split can occur. What happens here is it, it shoots out and gets underneath the layer. And then what happens is the integrity of this wall is now compromised. And this will, over time, if this remains um, open with some blood flow, so let's say you have blood flow down the true and the false, what's going to happen, and the patient I'll show you, is that it can become an aneurysm over time. So it gets dilated and can burst. And so you can imagine that the integrity of this wall is not nearly as strong as where it, where it is intact down here. Um, so you have to, we have to be very careful of the device that goes in. So we have to watch that, of course, that we don't get retrograde dissection, but also watching that um, it's going to not be so super stiff because this septum, as we call it, sometimes is very fibrotic and sometimes you need something stiff or just to make sure that it's not going to blow it out. Um, so we generally will look for a section of wall here that's reasonably normal to, to land the stent and have the stent seal here and down here. Um, there's different types and different problems that we deal with with these. So sometimes they aren't, they can occur here, which is heart surgery, and not a lot of devices yet with those. Some of the, um, the, the one I passed around, sometimes what's happening um, many times the valves of the heart are involved, and then the cardiac surgeons have to do something with the valve. Um, for we have not used these devices too many times in this area because we have the vessels to the head, right? So you can't really cover those up. Um, but the challenge sometimes can be how much. Here you have a patient who comes in emergently for heart surgery, and the patient I'll show you had that. Where if this is dissected like it is here, this is an emergency. Um, I have occasionally seen patients who have presented, and, and I actually it was a woman. I had, when I was in Pennsylvania, had a woman who um, I had done an aneurysm repair with a stent in her lower abdominal um, aorta, and she, I was seeing her in follow up, and she said, "You know, I've had this back pain for like two weeks." And she was a an apartment manager, and she moved things, and she said, "I just think that I like I probably strained myself." I said, you know, we should just, I kind of hemmed and hawed. Should I get another CT on her? CT people all the time, like, die in radiation. So I'm like, oh, we should CT you, just, just to be sure. Here she has something like this. She's been walking around for weeks, just feeling like there, she has this pain. So we immediately went to the operating room and got this fixed. So they had to fix not only her, this part of the vessel, but also the valve. Um, what there's not really shown up here, and what we're seeing more frequently, is this kind of unzipping of the vessel all the way down here. So this is the split where the, the vessel goes to each leg. And so you can see how our challenge is, how do we start dealing with 
so this part, we're dealing, the heart surgeon are dealing with open surgery. How do we start dealing with this area? So some of the things we're looking at and looking to you guys are thoughts about can we get devices, and they're working on this currently, that have branches on them. That when then if they have the branches, how can we deploy those and get them in the right position? And to get them in the right position, does that mean we have to do all sorts of cuts on the neck to get in the true lumina, the vessels up here? Or can we do it from other access in the groin and the femoral arteries? So that's our kind of new frontier if you're a pioneer in looking for projects in that area. Um, so we've seen now where it's a, not even up here, and actually we're, I guess it's a, this type A where it's really all the way, and it doesn't even end here, it goes all the way down. Um, and then there's various other ones we were showing here and even here. And so we really are struggling where we don't have devices for is what to do with the head vessels and these branches, um, and then also what to do with in the abdomen. So what about, you know, the, somebody was, you were talking about with liver and things, what do we do with to get perfusion to the liver from the celiac artery, the SMA artery? Because what will happen as this unzips, it sometimes kind of corkscrews around, and you can't always predict where it's going to go. And so what happens are some vessels will come off of the true perfused lumen. So let's say like the celiac and, and superior mesenteric artery, but the left kidney, kidney artery might come off the false channel. So then we worry, well, if we cover this, what's going to happen to that kidney? Does it go down? Does it not have blood flow? So these are all areas that we're, we're um, still not, we're just kind of figuring this out, and that's where we need help with. Um, so these are just, again, we call them, there can be acute, and as I said, for the ones that are going from down on the chest, um, those are actually are chronic. So this is, sometimes it's, it's hard for patients to believe, or I'm sure for you to even believe that you wouldn't just fix this right off the bat. The thing is, is that some of these can sort of stay quiet. So if you have a patient who's pretty well medically managed, has normal blood pressure, um, sometimes these dissections, that false channel will, will close off or sometimes it never gets any bigger. So that's the challenge from our end, is to figure out, does somebody actually need a device or not? Um, so this is where you can see, imagine, I am sure most of you in here would not prefer this, versus putting something inside like that device and not having to you know, open you up like a crescent roll package and, and get everything wide open. It's hard to, uh, to overcome. Um, it doesn't mean that we, we, did, we used to do this. When I was in training, this is what we did. And it's hard on a patient, even though, I mean, it's a big operation. Um, you're clamping the biggest artery in the, in the body um, and replacing it. I didn't pass around, but you can imagine the graft that's in that stent. Um, we would have that, not quite as slippery, but that would be what we would sew to. There would be no metal or anything on that. And so what we've done... Um, is taken this huge operation and now just made it either an incision in the groin or a puncture to deliver this. So what I passed around, um, I think the longer one, that company was the first company to come out in 2005 with a stent. So before that, when I was at University of Cincinnati, and I can say you could, it's all totally off label and it's no longer like, it's not a crime. But the, I actually, what we were doing is using pieces, using stents that we use in other areas of the body. And so in the inferior aorta down near the, the belly button. And we would actually, we had trauma victims because sometimes what would happen is when you're in a bad car accident, if you're head on collision, um, you're skiing, you hit a tree, you have a, de a fall, your aorta, what will happen is sometimes is that will, sh will uh, shear. And instead of getting this long dissection down the vessel, what you'll get is this short one. And it, um, we have to cover it with a short piece of graft. So back in like 2000, probably 2000, 2004, we were using a shorter piece like this in, in younger patients to not have to open them up like this and sew a graft in. So I have patients where they were 18 and in into the 20s um, where we would take, we took a device off-label use um, that we used down here, and we put it higher up. Part of the trouble was the devices. Um, the the device was like as big as my thumb as far as how it was packaged. So you can imagine, I can remember particularly taking care of a um, probably 18 or 19 year old college student that hit a tree um, skiing and had other issues going on, other abdominal issues, but also had this kind of pulverized aorta. And I thought, oh, you know, let me put this stent in to cover up the area, but then to get at the vessel. So she's petite. 
Her vessels are small, so I had to go up a little higher into her belly to be able to get the device in, but I didn't have to open up her chest with that. So this, this is not like, like technology 50 years ago or 30 years. I mean, this is literally like a little over a decade ago. When, um, and these devices now are about um, a little over 10 to probably 15 years where there's been different iterations and um, different uh, types made and rendi different renditions, I should say. So um, basically, uh, as we talk about different, you can use a graft or a stent, and we'll have pictures of that. So obviously it doesn't, you know, I tell patients, it's sort of one of these you pay now or later, and, and either some of them, um, there's some areas of the body, and particularly in the chest, where I feel like there's so much upfront cost to the patient that we've pretty much, I wouldn't say completely abandoned opening the chest, but almost, I would say, near the vast majority we do with endovascular. So if you're looking to say what could you fine tune in different in you know, that type of area and arena, um, those stents are not going away, guarantee. There's, we're, um, because there's not as much complexity from, so the last blood vessel when we were showing the arch branches or the branches to the head, the third one to the left, the one to the left is to the arm. So anything really from this arm vessel down to about the diaphragm area, there's no branches there. So there's, there's no way that that device is ever going to be like, oh, that, we're debunking that, that didn't work. Um, we will, that will always be something we use. And we've gone away from um, um, really opening up the chest anymore to do that. And I would say uh, because we know the paralysis rate is better, the patients do better overall. So we do anything we can to ensure that we can use this device in some sort of fashion. Um, so this is just looking at um, more and more. So if you say, well, is, you know, are these going to be around for a while or are we going to be using these? Um, this is what we see happening as we start to study things. There's various trials throughout the world where we start to see if we use these stents um, that the mortality or the chance of the patient dying is decreasing um, down the road. So sometimes it isn't always immediately when it happens, but later on. So this is, and, and again, I, uh, I'll kind of go through how we do this and you know, let me know any questions or if you, you know, wires or different sorts of things. I would say from, from the, somebody who was talking about robotic stuff, um, we haven't yet sort of embraced the robots used in a lot of different areas in surgery. Vascular surgery, we haven't really, um, because we really deal with um, inside vessel sort of stuff, we haven't really gone to the, the robot um, too much with that uh, because we already deal with miniaturized stuff um, in the vessels. Doesn't mean there couldn't be a role for that. Um, I think. There are lots of devices, and you probably have heard at some of this conference how valves and the heart are treated um, now with putting a device up through the groin. The access to a lot of this is through the femoral artery in the groin, and so uh, it's pretty straightforward to get access to that. We use ultrasound to take a look at that. How we get in, and um, just to kind of review this, um, what we have um, when we go in is we will use ultrasound and we will look at the artery, uh, in the, so in the femoral artery in the groin, we look at the artery under ultrasound, we put a hollow needle into the artery under ultrasound and watching the needle go in, and then through that needle is a wire, um, and it's, uh, it's weird because, as you know, there's all sorts of different size, like wires and needles and things are all different measurements, so needles have a gauge, as you probably know, Wires are go, go by inches, so we like to talk about an 035, and it's strange. And then other things are by French size and millimeters, so um, all sorts of different sizes. But essentially, that hollow needle goes into the artery. So now you have blood, you have a tr you have an entryway into the artery, and then a wire goes into that. And the wires are all sorts of different stiffness and floppiness and that type of thing. Because this um, patient, this is from a patient I worked on last October. Um, it's a little hard to do I have. I don't think I have a wire up here. This is a catheter. So the wire, so once we get the wire in, obviously you want the tip, and for any of you developing any things like this, um, you have to have integrity of the wire, right? Because we're going to try to pass even that stent that's packaged on something probably about the size of my pinky. The, the, the wire's got to be strong enough that you can, you know, that it doesn't bend or buckle when you try to advance the device over it. So what will happen is the wire will go up, but you don't want the tip of the wire to injure stuff, right? So we have to be careful that we're not, we're watching. So what I'm doing is using radiation and fluoroscopy 
to watch as the wire is going up into the body and going up into, and this is up in the chest. So this is the, uh, the heart is down here, and this is black here because we have a dye in the blood vessel. So when the wire goes up here, now I have something that I can work over, we call. So um, with that wire up, this is a catheter, and the catheter is just a, is a tubing, um, and there's different sizes and shapes and different things, and this is called a pigtail because the end kind of looks curved here. And this is how we get the dye into the blood vessels. So the pigtail catheter will be hooked up at the end of it. It's like a hose, with, and these are marks on it. And so this is what we're going to do to take pictures and put dye inside the blood vessel, and that shows us the picture here. Um, and so these go in and out over wires. And so when we put that device in that, that we passed around, um, that's, you can see here, this is a patient who has, you can see the dissection piece here, where he's got flow not only in his true lumen, but also in this false channel here. And so he's somebody that actually had a surgery done. He had a dissection that went from his heart all the way down to the kind of belly button area. So in 2006, he had this done with open surgery when he first had the dissection that involved the heart valves. So this is all like a plastic material or cloth kind of like tent material like Gore-Tex or kind of a Dacron material. That gets sewn in here. So that was years, that was like a decade or 15 years prior. Um, and then um, now what's happened is this false channel has gotten very big. You can see it's almost twice the size of this. And so what I've done, you can see the stent has come around here, so we've got some different techniques where we actually will put um, different stents in to try to still have blood flow, and because again, I don't have a branch device, I have to bring in this extra stent and do some maneuvering here to try to have blood flow go to all these sorts of things, and then still plug this up and have this ha um, not have flow. So what we do, and um, in the meantime, and this, probably seems weird to you, like why would we do we use stuff that's not meant to, to act in this way? But sometimes it's an issue of if the patient's not a great candidate for uh, just reopening the chest, and you might, um, that's obviously a, a pretty big deal. Um, what we will sometimes do is different types of techniques where we use compressible stents, and we'll have these stents, and this one I have where, um, the stent is going to come through and it's going to sandwich or parallel alongside this big graph so that the blood flow will actually go out the subclavian through this, um, this little, what we call like a sandwich or chimney stent that's covered and also through here. And so they'll be kind of double barreled but only to be double barreled to get the blood flow to the arm here in this left artery and then down the, the aorta. And this is because currently there is nothing like this on the market. So sometimes in these scenarios, again, we've just sort of like, well, um, we would like to try to do something for the patient that's not going to involve maximal surgery, and these are some of the things you can do. This is a, you can see the wire. Here's, the, here's one of the wires up. And this actually has a curve on it. This is about as stiff, you know, we kind of laugh. It's like a coat hanger kind of thing, almost not quite that stiff, but it's very, very stiff because that graft, we have to be able to track it up there that the wire doesn't bend. And of course, you can't have that wire, um, this is one of the things we have to watch, that this wire doesn't, wouldn't pop into the heart or things like that, so there's this curved tail on it here um, to, so that it, it doesn't bounce off the valve, but it, it can be close to that. Um, so we have all sorts of names of these different branches or things like that, of uh, snorkels or chimneys or things that, how we talk to describe kind of what we're doing. I'm just gonna stop there for a second of, Anybody have any ideas or questions or things about, about this? Yeah. We're holding it. So, so the biggest thing is, you know, and, and um, I work with a, a couple of engineers using some intravascular ultrasound stuff, and we talk about different things, and so what are the, the needs? One of the things we have to worry about, in addition to watching everything that's going on, is what's happening with that wire. So that wire, you can imagine if, if it's not held or pinched, that wire's like 260 centimeters long or 320 centimeters long. So the end of that wire, like half of that wire is out of the body. And on that long table, so um, someone is at the end of the wire, near the end of it, pinching it actually to hold it. And so if anybody has any good ideas to like secure that in a way, because you can imagine, so I'm, I'm doing this case, I'm, I gotta watch that 
the wire is being held, I'm not looking at the person, but I have to make sure, and I'm, while I'm imaging, I can tell if they're holding it or not, because if this pops forward, I'm like, well, no, pin, pin the wire, we call it. So it's not, it's, it's got to have, uh, be in the right position, but then held. And that's where we have a struggle of, you know, should there be something where we could clamp it and not have to worry about it? Because I'll tell you, you know, we work with all sorts of techs and nurses in the, who are scrubbed as well, and residents and fellows, and they all, everybody's doing a different job. And so everybody's role is important. So I've seen it where if somebody's not holding that wire, the, obviously the wire can jump forward, but it can kind of, instead of being straight like this, it can kind of knuckle or buckle like that. So as you're trying to get the stent in, if it doesn't advance, it could, you could have bent the, bent the wire. So there's all sorts of different, even just, it sounds really simple, but even something like that of the, the wire. Because somebody asked me one time, well, why wouldn't you just like clamp it like a vice type of thing on the side of the table to, so that you wouldn't have to um, have somebody hold it? Part of the trouble is we have to do these exchanges where you, my, like my catheter might have gone over that, then I get my device off and on. But you could unclamp it, you know. And so that's an area, I would say, of need. Um, and, and similar things like in the brain, when we do stenting in the carotid artery, which is just a, a stent to open up plaque, it's the same sort of thing. You don't want the wire, and you also have to be mindful, where's the tip of that wire that is not going further into the brain or somewhere where you don't want it. So uh, the wire is critical. It sounds like a very basic, kind of simplistic kind of thing, but it's what we train our trainees is like, it's a lifeline of the procedure. If you lose wire access, let's say you, the wire comes out of the body, the whole thing like collapses. So it's super important. So I'm gonna just keep going what we did. So what with this guy is, um, and here's just some, this is CT images. Um, and you can see here's a technique that I, was, that I did where um, instead of doing an operation, so one of the things you can do is open somebody's neck and sew a bypass graft from the carotid artery here, which is in the left neck over to the subclavian artery, which goes to the left arm. You can sew that and then tie this off so that your stent could land right in here. Um, that way you would still have blood flow to the left arm and you could have a landing zone, we call it, where there's a normal part of the blood vessel that you can land the stent. Um, there's, this is where we're talking about we don't have a, a device on the market. Um, there's some being developed by um, two different companies to um, make this be a part of this, of this device so that we wouldn't have to put this in separately. So I put this in as a kind of chimney technique where again, the blood, you're hoping that you get enough seal because this works by um, sealing things, right? So what, how we size it is that we want this part that's sealing here to be, be, be quite a bit larger than the actual artery so that there's seal and blood's not leaking around it and going into the area of defect. This was somebody actually, this is a, where somebody had trauma right in here um, and this is what we were treating at the time for that. And these are just some different, um, another picture of just a, the stent in this area. Um, what happens a lot of times is um, um, you see, you know, it looks weird on the CAT scan. These are reconstructed um, three-dimensional pictures, so they're kind of cartoons. So it's not uh, that blood is kind of leaking out of these wires. You don't tend to see the fabric, I guess is what I should say. So unlike the, on the device that passed, was passed around, you really won't see the fabric very well. So you wind up seeing the wires, exoskeleton, and then um, the, the rest of the vessel. And this is actually one where, um, this is also another area of study that I'll, I'll get to in a little bit, where actually I have the branch Instead of doing this configuration, this, this sort of piece is in here, and it goes down to this artery here in the, in the belly, so just to, to get our seal. Um, and this is, again, sort of another configuration uh, where actually what can sometimes happen is we can move the head vessel. So with a, um, one of our heart surgeons, um, what we did is actually move, take the head vessels, and we t sewed them in here, and then we're able to, to stent that. So getting back to the guy, that, uh, the patient that uh, I was working with, um, so what we did is put us here, this big dissection area, and you can see here you no longer see the, the artery going to the arm because I did a bypass up here, and then I put a plug in here. So that's another thing. Um, plugs are, sometimes you want to specifically close off an artery, so of course if it's bleeding, or here what we don't want is blood to leak back into this sac and so we put the plug in here. And so 
this patient, um, we use blood thinner during the case, we put the covered stent in, we get all this. I still see a little bit of blush in that old sac. And so at this stage, so we've, we've got the stent in, it's going all the way from here, you can see it to down here. And so many times if we still see a little bit of blush or image in that, we will, let the, we will finish there because we don't see it coming out of here. This all looks pretty good. It's just this delayed kind of filling. We'll let the blood thinner wear off and then we'll get, we'll get a scan and see it. Usually, uh, and here's where I took a picture. This is now lower down into the, probably right around the diaphragm. You can see his wires here from his prior heart surgery. Um, here's the vessels in the abdomen. So the diaphragm's like right around, probably like right around here. And you can see, I took a picture here, and I don't see any what we call retrograde filling. So I have a seal here, and I don't see blood flowing back into his false channel here. So I've just got that, that part above, uh, the back here, just this part here. So I feel like, okay, I'm going to see how it goes for him um, and stop there and see what, what happens. So uh, one of the things I also look at and, um, is intravascular ultrasound. So this is actually where we stick a mini camera, um, it's ultrasound, inside the artery. And this is a great tool for seeing the dissection flap in the channel. So this is actually, there's the catheter in the middle here, um, and the, the, the aorta itself. And this is where you can kind of see the, the double barrel sort of technique, or what it looks like. This is all his old false lumen, and here's his true lumen. And so what we can see is this, I don't see a lot of flow in this, uh, but I see uh, the, the flow or the, where we have flow, a lot of times it'll show up more dark. So just kind of giving you an example of what it looks like. And here's another example where, again, you see the, a tr um, the true lumen and this is the false lumen, and you see this sort of septum area here between the two channels. So this is a great way for us to look at it, and sometimes the ways we can see where there's openings between the true and the false, and then um, a little bit uh, where we can see where the branches are a bit too. So this is our guy that we did, um, the, that we just showed. And one of the things, this is a, a CAT scan, and, and there's lots of different pictures I could get, but I wanted to show you where things look pretty good here, but I still see some flow in this area. Um, and so what I'm concerned about is there's still this part that's not, didn't go away. Um, you can see here how weird this looks. Um, the, there's, this is his true lumen blood flow, and granted, this is a three-dimensional, so I can rotate the, the object or rotate this picture. Um, but then there's also this sort of haziness around here. That's the false channel. So there's still some flow in his false channel in the belly. But again, when you think about where the branch, where the branches come off, where the flow is, some of this gets really narrow here. So I have a patient currently that um, I'm seeing tomorrow who's got problems with his legs. He's only 40. Um, he came in and had this part done, and th the rest of this looks okay. I haven't had to do anything with this yet, but he's got this compression here where the true flow to his legs is coming through this teeny little hole and it's supposed to be really about this big. So there can be problems with the legs sometimes too from, from that. So, so anyway, I, this our, the guy that we treated, now I'm seeing him back I'm like, oh, there's still some flow here. And I, even though I have a covered scent in here, I worry that that could still rupture, he could bleed from that. Um, another view of that again, just sort of showing you how this kind of corkscrews around. What, this is the right kidney. Notice what you don't see is really highlighting or good highlighting of his left kidney. He has flow to it, but it's not great. So it doesn't, and that flow, you can see it's coming off of actually this false channel over here. So this kind of yellow white is actually the, the true channel. Um, so what I did is I said, okay, there's another thing, um, another type of device we use. I was saying there's a plug to plug things up. There's also a thing, these little coils that we put in, in blood vessels. And sometimes we put those in in small blood vessels. And here what I was trying to do is I, I came back in um, and actually the plug, and I can use the name, it's Amplatzer plug, is one of the ones we use where it's got, it's almost like a little, I want to be like a little spongy sort of stuff that's really sticky. And it goes in, um, you know, a pretty thin little device. And that's what plugged up so I didn't have flow coming backward this way. And so what I was able to do is I, I got into the arm vessel, just like again with a needle, I went in, and I was able to get a catheter, believe it or not, around that plug. Um, and so sometimes we always think, oh, that once that plug's there, that's it, you can't get around that. But devices are still sometimes very soft inside the blood vessels. So I was able to get around that, and I put these coils, and the coils are like these, imagine um, 
Oh, almost what you want to use piano wire is kind of what it looks like to me. It's really flexible, like this long kind of wire. And some of them have little furry things on it to make it really, you want something to clot or close down. And so what happens is when you push that little wire out of the device, it curls up like a little um, tornado. And some of the coils are called tornadoes. And what I wanted to do is see, there was still some flow, remember, going into that sack. I wanted to plug this up and see if I could stop the flow from that. So that's another area where those go in and, and plug that up. So I thought, okay, and the patient comes back to me and he's like, oh, I feel great, best I've felt, and not like I thought this did, did much. Hopefully I was wanting to close down that channel. Uh, but he came back and he's still got a little bit here. So he's, what we're gonna do, um, Next for him is, because we need this, we can't have this, as long as it still has flow, there's a risk of that rupturing. And so just to kind of give you an idea, the diameter now, this is out to about like eight centimeters. That blood vessel where the stent is about three centimeters. So uh, we still, since we still have flow, there's still a risk that that will rupture and bleed and could kill him. So the next thing we're gonna do is something um, and I don't know why they call it this, but it's called an elephant trunk or a, a frozen elephant trunk where basically we'll go back in, he and our, um, our heart surgeon and myself, and basically what we'll do is reroute some of these vessels and sew to the stent that's in there. And you can sew to that fabric that's on top of that. So sometimes we still have to go back despite all our devices and still come back to uh, surgery with that. So any questions about that? The next two cases I have are not quite as long, but that's, and so I think that, um, when I'm talking about some branch sort of device stuff, but for the thoracic endograph, we call it, or T-VAR, that sort of thing, that um, and branching of that for the head vessels, again, remember the population of patients, about 10,000 or so per year, or so you have to think, okay, who's in the market for that, what companies, takes a lot to develop, um, and so we're clamoring for these types of things, but again, the volume, and who's going to need that and the skill to get that in, um, you know, that's sometimes companies will think about, you know, is that really the way to go and how much do we want to take that? Because obviously it costs a lot to R&D that and then to bring it to safety and bring it to a patient population uh, and bring it to centers such as ours that, that do this sort of stuff. Um, you know, it, it's a lot. So that's, we have all these great ideas. We're in the OR like, God, why doesn't somebody just make this with this if we wouldn't have to do this? <clears throat> but again, there's all the other side you guys probably think about is what's really going to be the market and what's the need and, and all that. Yeah. Uh, you have used many plastic face saving side and you have the glue to uh, make that safer than Actually, we don't use it. It's a great question. So in dissections, we actually don't use a balloon. So when these are delivered, or when they're on their device, on the what we call the delivery system, that's about as big as my thumb, and this is all packaged super tight. And there's sort of a rip cord, or a you either have a rip cord or something that you unscrew and it unfolds and opens up, and it really sticks by radial force. And so in dissections, uh, remember we were talking like we're worried if sometimes those barbs might dig in and cause a, a dissection to go toward the heart. We really almost never balloon those because we're worried about that, that the dissection's kind of fragile, and if we balloon it, it, will cause the, it could cause it to burst open or ad advance the dissection. So for dissections, we're very careful to put it in and kind of leave it where it is, but it opens up to this shape, and um, we, don't, we won't balloon it typically because we're worried about what will happen to the, the vessel underneath. Yeah, and it just expands, right. So this is called like a self-expanding type of thing. So this, this and dissections are really the, the main one where we're not going to do any ballooning after it goes in. But I'll show you this next one. This is a, uh, a case where um, some device failure. And I'm just going to pass this around. So this is moving into another area of the body <laughs> that um, in the um, aorta below the kidney arteries. And this is a very, a much more common area um, and where the device has been around for a while for endovascular aneurysm repair, and this is where everything kind of started with us in, in really kind of the late 80s or 90s, and I'm just going to pass this around for you to look at while we're talking. This device goes in, um, and, and you'll see just I have an example of where the device didn't work so well. Um, so this device goes in as, think of it like a pair of pants, where you have kind of the waist and the, and the hip area and one leg, uh, and then the other leg is a cutoff, and you're going to put another piece in to seal it. And so uh, endovascular aneurysm repair, and 
This was how we still occasionally sometimes do it. And this is where we've had enough experience. There was just, just actually an article in the, the journal, The Lancet, um, that has done 15 years of, ex of looking at results and outcomes. And um, the endovascular androgen repair, which we're passing around, versus our open repair. And um, it's been pretty well studied. We were part of it when we were at University of Cincinnati of open surgery for the aneurysm versus endovascular. And there a, a, was quite a significant mortality advantage to endovascular repair early on around the time of surgery. As time went out further, um, that kind of went away. Um, so it's like the same thing I was saying before I tell patients, you kind of, it's, there's no free lunch with any, there's always trade-offs to a lot of this. And so what's happened in this arena for devices is it started off as, this is going to be something for, you know, the fragile, the older patient. And as time went on, we said, gee, you know, what about, like, boy, if I had to have this when I was 60 years old, I'd much rather have this than you open up my belly, just like we were saying with the chest. And so an open, the over trial was one that was done around the, the U.S. And some of the thought leaders in that actually were from this area. And um, basically we randomized patients to open or this sort of endovascular technique. And that's when we sort of found out that, and this was just back in the early 2000s, that endovascular, the patients um, made it through the operation more often than they did with open surgery. Still, the chance of dying from this was reasonably small, somewhere, you know, 2 to 3%. But still, you know, there was a significant difference. So this is how we used to, how we sometimes occasionally still do it. Uh, it's basically sew something in that's a Gore-Tex kind of temp material or a Dacron, and you clamp the artery here, you sew this in here, sew it down here. Um, and, you know, that went on, went on for, you know, many decades that we did that. This guy, uh, Juan Perotti from Brazil, some, he was really kind of the father of all this and still alive and looks, he's, he's aged well, he looks about the same. The interesting case claim to fame before he even went down this path of doing anything with devices, he took out the gallbladder of one of the popes and I just found this out at one of our vascular meetings and he presented as, as one, a luminary who won some device award for our vascular society and we're like, oh my God, really? So when, um, and you're from Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati. This man, Tom Fogarty, um, worked at uh, Good Samaritan Hospital, um, was a uh, tech, actually, in the operating room back in, this would be probably like in the 50s and 60s, um, where he figured out, and this is how, like, again, like, you guys all know this for device, but where you're just like, God, I wish there was something better we could use. Like, what if we tried this? And so he was a tech handing instruments to the surgeon and... Um, uh, the Cranley group is a group of surgeons that was really prominent in Cincinnati in the era, and he was doing some urologic surgery. He was handing them, and they said, God, we're trying to, this is back in the day when kidney stones, imagine this, where they were cutting you open, and they would cut your ureter open and like pull, put a catheter up there and pull stones out of your, your kidney and your ureter. And so he said, you know, gosh, there's a lot of patients who get clots in their arteries. We should be able to put some, like, balloon up and like pull the clot out of the artery, much like you would do like a drain snake or something where you're going to get something out of your drain. And so he came up with that. He was, a, he was not a physician. He was just a tech. And he tied, a t he cut a tip off of a glove, tied it to the end of the catheter, and then he would inflate that. And then he would push it in past the clot, and he would inflate it, and he was trying this on animal models, and then he would pull the clot out. So that now, today, still lives as the Fogarty embolectomy catheter. We use it almost daily in different things. He has 90-some patents. Of His first patent was some motorcycle clutch thing. And I took care of one of his sisters when I was a faculty at the University of Cincinnati. Um, Unfortunately, he's not donated much to the University of Cincinnati, so he's, he now, if you ever, he has a big vineyard out in California. He was at Stanford after, um, once he kind of, uh, one of the, the, he was one of the initial guys to really get into this endovascular aneurysm repair um, and the stent uh, design. Him and Chris Zarens, another vascular surgeon from Chicago area, um, all were out at Stanford and got into this. And now he's got a lovely winery, and his wine is actually quite good. If you, Fogarty Vineyards, F-O-G-A-R-T-Y. He actually got, when from uh, former President Obama, got a, a device, Medal of, uh, some type for uh, device uh, and, and just his innovation thing. So very, very colorful guy. Um, so basically this was done just like we were talking about to exclude the sac um, from expansion. And essentially, again, what we used to do is sort of sew this in. 
And this is where um, it goes in through the groin arteries, and now we even do it where we just use a puncture and don't um, get the, um, have to cut down. And so here you can see the question before about the wire. Here's the wire is coming out here. And this is just a drawing here, but if I had the wire, the wire would be all the way down here. And that wire kind of goes up to about here. And so this goes in, you can kind of see, here's like the, what we'll call like the waist and the, the hip area of the pants and the, the one leg. And this is sort of, now we're bringing in the other leg. And so that the seal for the device, and, and this is also a device that self-expands. So when we put it in, this one actually, you want this, if this artery here is say 20 millimeters in diameter, we would want this to be about 24 millimeters in diameter. So when it springs open, the radial force of that will sort of stick. But you know from how this feels, it's still pretty flexible. So this is where we actually do use a balloon to really get a good seal. Because we have pretty good integrity of this artery here. So we put it in and to get a super good that it's sealing and not leaking around here, we'll, uh, we'll balloon that area. Um, and then what we want is for this to have a couple centimeters of seal here and down here. And what we don't want is anything to leak into the sac. And so this will, uh, and this has been around now for, for many years, many different iterations of devices. There's, um, when I first came out in training, there were two companies doing this now. There's at least probably seven to eight different types. Um, things that we've sort of struggled with, and this is sort of the Achilles heel, and um, I'll show you where this patient is. So we tell patients, and this is where we say you kind of pay now or you pay late. There's all there's follow up and a lot of things with both these opener or endovascular. But one of the things we we struggle with, and um, again, a, a great opportunity for people interested in device, is how do we prevent type one endoleak? So one of the things that's really um, it's great if you get the patient with the perfect anatomy has a nice seal zone here and down here, but. Sadly, not everybody's made the same way, and sometimes this aneurysm will encroach up on the kidney artery, toward the kidney arteries, and you won't have enough neck, or meaning this, maybe you want this, the indication for use might say, you need a 10 to 15 millimeter seal zone, but we're like, oh, but Mrs. Jones, she's, you know, we want to make this work, and let's do, like, what if we just have a 12 millimeter seal zone and not 15? So I would say as, as surgeons, we're always kind of trying, you know, it's, and so there's different sorts of devices. Now we have, um, uh, there, there are different types of screws or anchors or things that we use, and actually now what we're doing is, if we have what was called a hostile neck, or there's maybe an angle, this isn't perfect here, so to prevent this leak occurring later, where blood will go around here, um, you know the little like spring inside of a click pen, that little cork, that little uh, wire bed spring little thing, they actually make those now where when this device is up inside, we can take, take something up, where then it, and we park it and push it against the wall of the device, um, and it's kind of, it's not screwing, but there's a little motor in the thing, and it screws the screw in and basically anchors it to the wall. So you can imagine what I was telling at the beginning of the talk, all the different angles you have to get with your C-arm and the radiation. And remember, we're looking at a two-dimensional image. We're looking on the screen, and it's two dimensions, and we're dealing with a three-dimensional device. So if we say, okay, I'm gonna put some, some anchors in here, and we talk about like a clock face, like I wanna put one at three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock. I'm just kind of guessing where I think that, it, I mean, I get an angle and I think, okay, I, I see where these marks are for radio opaque markers and, and kind of, if I haven't lined up right, but it's real, you know, we're kind of just taking our best guess for where to put those anchors for that. So those are another area where, you know, how do we, how can we really tell? I would love to know if I need to put a, an anchor at three o'clock, am I really at three o'clock? You know, now I could put in an, an um, intravascular ultrasound and maybe see that, but sometimes the ultrasound, you don't know exactly, you know where you are in space, but you don't know exactly which way it's turned. So it's another area, but that's where we are now. So <laughs> the other thing is robotics. I think somebody was talking about robotics. Um, and there are some things where people are doing some staples in addition to where there's been anchors or those little screws or little staples. Um, some people have even talked about are there ways you could stitch this in, but then you know you gotta go inside. You could do it laparoscopically, of course, but different things. So there's those leaking around here, around here. Um, sometimes these little guys too can leak. These are lumbar arteries that you would think, now the physics, this defies physics, but 
if this clots off, why would you imagine flow would come into something of resistance? And this is, we can't figure, you know, somebody who dealt with a lot of fluid mechanics, I can't figure this out. But the flow actually sometimes, and this happens years later sometimes, and this is why we had to watch, will come into a lumbar artery and it may not go out another one, it may, but you know, why would the flow go in here where there's clot? This doesn't make any sense. But what can happen is then that can kind of have flow in the sac and the patient's at risk again for rupture. So to watch for that. What I'm going to show you, the case is where we had device component separation. So the, the next, the limb that went in. Um, and here's a CAT scan, and this is a coronal image where we're kind of looking at kind of the whole patient. This is just a CAT scan, and there's no dye in this. Here's the liver, um, and you can see the aorta here. And this um, device right here is supposed to be going up here. So obviously the surgeon, you know, didn't put it in that way. But what happens over time, and this is where... Um, one of the companies I went to kind of look at some of their device stuff, and um, they were showing me some different things in their lab, and, you know, they, they simulate, like, what all the different heart, you know, cardiac cycle and pulsations that this device has to go through for 15, 20 years. You're imagining the patient might live 20, 30, 40 years. So the, for the fatigue factor, so you can imagine things are constantly pulsating. And so what can happen is that, where that, uh, that device is, um, when those, if there's pulsations, the force going down like that, um, is that, what's that gonna have on the impact where there's this bifurcation? So this is one of the things we've talked about is, when you have flow coming down here, it's gonna go down each of these um, channels uh, where the stents and go to each leg. But over time, it's just can be what's gonna, ha will the device kink? And this is what we, why we tell the patient we have to constantly follow this. So it's not like every month, but we see, you have to see these patients every year. And what we're finding out now is that you can never tell the patients with these devices, like, yeah, just go have a good life. We'll never see you again. We, ha we are now seeing when you get out to like seven, eight, nine years that now we're starting to see some of this stuff happen. So this is a, actually a type 3 endoleak. And here's a, I think this was a classic picture we see. There's only supposed to be two lumens here, or two things. You see three. So this is the dye. This picture actually has some dye. So you should see dye here. So what you see are two different problems. You see, number one, the device didn't go up into the pant leg or kind of the second piece. As it's come out of that. And in the meantime, thank goodness, um, for the patient's sake, that it didn't just all of a sudden fill with blood and like, rupture. But actually what happened is this closed off. So what happened, two things, is not only did the device kind of come apart, but then this thing closed off and clotted off. And this patient presented with, you know, when I walk my left leg, I'm having some problems where I, my left leg gets tired. That's the, you know, should we, you know, that's the kind of subtle, like, yeah. And so a lot of times, um, you know, if they're not, you know, we see it maybe every six months to once a year, um, you know, the patients have collateral flow. They'll be, they will get flow down their leg. It's not that there's nothing, but um, sometimes this can happen, and, it, and you think, oh, my gosh, you know, how could a patient go like this? But um, here's where when we did an angiogram, and this was um, one of my partners, and here we have a, we just put dye in here, and this is in the right femoral artery. This dye should just rock it right up here. So what we see is that there's no flow going really past this, the limb has come undone. This is the, the little metal ring here. This should be inside this device up here. So this has kind of come undone. <clears throat> so I don't know if I have another picture of this, no. Um, so actually what we wind up doing is relining this. So opening this up, and we just made this one limb. And so we put another uh, straight device, kind of not one this big, but sort of a tube and went in there and then made the blood flow just come down here, kind of what it was doing already, but this was all closed off on the left side. And then we sewed a bypass graft from, from down here in the femoral artery to over on this side to add flow. Um, some people might say, well, gee, why can't you just like kind of bore through that and put, a, um, put another device in, like you might for plaque in the heart arteries or leg arteries, but this is clot in here. So sometimes if we were trying to bore through that and put another stent in here, it will toothpaste or squish out the clot down into the leg where the arteries are normal. So once this is kind of done uh, or closed off, it's very hard to reopen or reuse it. And who would want to because it's not going in the right place. Um, so some of the other things um, we're getting into, and these have been around for a few years, are some of these branch things. So this is the probably, again, one of the hotter areas of our um, of how to 
Let's move the seal zone up. And remember saying, if we didn't have good neck here, can we bring this up and get a tighter seal and still perfuse the branches? Um, and that's a, an area um, where right now there's only, really only one main company that's dealing with branches in this fashion. Um, it takes a while, it takes on average four to six weeks to send the images to this company and have the company make the device. Um, and figure out the holes in the lineup. And so it's not typically an off-the-shelf sort of thing. And this is why, in the meantime, we've done some other innovative things to try to you know, still work with patients who need something done urgently. And these are different things. And um, I was um, serving as sort of a, an advisor to one of the companies about how to work this up in the arch area. And part of the trouble is the fatigue, right? So for those of you who deal with the durability and device um, and fabrics, and pinching. So what happens when you insert something like this to so they can get flow to the branch, but there's constant pulsation at a 90 degree angle, and how does that pinch this stent? And that's what we're seeing when this is done in the lab, is that the, uh, the stent closes down because it gets pinched from that angle. So just some scans of what's sort of going on and being done. We're, you know, again, we're looking for more development in this area. Because we kind of think this is sort of an unnatural angle, and that shouldn't it be where maybe is a gradual sloping, maybe that right angle wouldn't be um, something, maybe something more gradual would be better. And so these are the different techniques I was talking about up in the arch, where we kind of have this parallel sort of thing. So we, we get seal around here, and the, the flow comes in through this way a bit more natural. But this is totally off-label. We, we use these different stent, these, these stents differently because we only have one option with this company. And then finally, I want to just sort of show you, this is um, for cannulas and tubings and device. This is also, and, and this is ECMO. And it's, um, and, and are any of you familiar with this? Do you guys know? Anybody heard of this? This is basically, so um, it's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and it used to be used just in babies for um, if babies' lungs weren't functioning or when they were born there were issues. And basically it takes over the total circulatory support and oxygenation of your blood. And so we've had like drownings or kids or severe flu where the lungs can't oxygenate blood, and then there's, there's heart failure accompanying with that. So this kind of takes over. It's like super, it's like bypass for the lungs and for the arteries. And so this is the sort of device. It's an external device, but then you have these cannulas that go in and support the heart and lungs. So they oxy this oxygenates the blood, which is what the lungs should do, and it pumps the blood, which is what the heart should do, while resting things that recover. Um, so sometimes when patients can't get off of heart-lung machine or the heart... Uh, uh, machine after a heart bypass, they, they go on this. So I only get involved because I, I had this for a talk for the complications, and I'm hoping maybe you can, can take this away as, again, some ideas. So again, like most things, the gateway to get into here are arteries and veins, typically in the groin, um, and sometimes occasionally in the neck for the veins. And so what the ideal scenario is something like this, and these look enormous, and they are. Um, and these are on the order of, if you think about French size, which is um, uh, about 0.3 millimeter, the size of, the, of these um, is in the range of like 18 to 16 French, somewhere in that size. And so um, this is going up. One of these is a venous cannula, where it's draining blood away from the body and back into that oxygenator over here. And the other one is going up into the artery and pumping blood. So you can imagine, this is not our typical patient where there's no, you know, obesity, nothing. It's just normal, um, very thin. The problem is you can imagine that sticking this in, in the person's artery is not going to bode well for blood flow going down the leg. And so even though you're trying to preserve the, uh, the body and the heart, you can have issues where you're going to have limb ischemia or ischemia of the leg because you don't have flow. So this is an anti-grade cannula. So what they're doing is we take blood from the side of this and have it to go down into the leg. And so they do, people are being put on this, and this has probably been in the last five to 10 years. This is happening at, at other hospitals when they ship the patients here, they can't manage them. It sometimes is happening in the emergency department. In France, they do it even sometimes, this is in the Louvre. Um, and they actually do it in the, uh, like on the street or in, I mean, that they're paramedic, which just blows my mind actually that that would, you could even get survival with anything like that. Um, 
And so some of the things with, when we look about it, again, the ideal scenario, some of the complications of this sort of thing, you're trying to, of course, preserve the person um, and there's a good chance that they're going to survive, but you want to make sure that they don't have all these other complications. And so vascular complications are, are pretty prevalent. Um, and so w when I was at Penn State, we had, a, we had the, one of those second, well, I think we had the second largest ECMO program in the country, and we had a lot of these outcomes and things we looked at. And this is a cannula that actually then goes into the artery going down the leg to try to get blood flow in. And so that goes in, but you can imagine in scenarios, this is the ideal situation what you would like is, right, this, here's the bone and here's the, the artery. So what this is is this is the anagrade cannula here. This big thing is the tube going up, the, the, the cannula bringing blood back in toward the, to the body from that oxygenator. Uh, this is documenting that this anagrade blood flow cannula is actually delivering blood into the artery as it should. But... Um, that's what we would like. Sometimes it doesn't always work out that well. So sometimes people have small vessels and we have to sew a little graft on and get that cannula in. Um, sometimes there can be problems. So here's, um, you know, this is, these patients many times, um, I said, you know, sometimes do it, use it after an operation, but a lot of times it's people crashing, people have an MI, they have issues, and they wind up putting these cannulas in, not under direct, they put them in kind of somewhat blindly. So here's an example where the catheter kind of ends here, and here's the artery. So it didn't quite make the target, and so what happens, you have all this blood pouring in through that side sheath and didn't get where it needed to go. Um, this is actually, uh, I just wrote this up as a, Sometimes what happens, this is the knee, here's the head up here, and here's the patient's leg. Sometimes you get people who have lots of plaque and buildup and their arteries you can't get into that vessel. So this patient had the ECMO cannula here, could not um, get perfusion to the rest of his legs, so we actually, um, we could not get this, uh, this is the, the sheath, the artery that I'm going to is right below the knee in here, um, and that artery uh, was smaller than this, sheath here. So what I did is actually sew a little graft to the side of that artery and bring that little piece of graft under here, put this cannula, the sheath in that, sew that so that there could be blood going downstream. And then a few days later when this, when the patient was better and the cannulas were removed, I could come back in and take the plastic graft out because that might get infected, take that out, take everything out. So there are all these little different things that these are sort of unmet needs of how we can get things in, and what do we do when this is occluded up here, um, where the blood vessel is blocked with chronic plaque buildup and disease that we can't get that perfusion to go. Uh, and this is the, the, some more pictures where I had, had done this, close it up, and then you can see here, here's where it's going in up in here. And this patient, actually, what had happened, he had closed this off, but he had an aneurysm, kind of like that device we passed around. He was like, what is the, the luck of this guy? He had an aneurysm here and clot, so this cannula went through that and was just chattering or kind of moving around a little bit as it was supporting the patient, and it dislodged some clot. And so what happened is the clot then came down and was all around the cannula. So it corked off all the vessels, and we couldn't get into any of these. So this is why we had to kind of go below. So lots of um, just things that you kind of get thrown at you. So I kind of wound up... Um, this was a cake I made one of my when I was in Pennsylvania. We made a little aorta cake for our graduating fellow. But I think the thing I want to kind of end on is just that the vascular devices. I just hope I've just given you kind of an overview of how much you know. I think about this in my lifetime for as a vascular surgeon, my career. How much has changed? And I look at this as we are still going in that direction. And I, th I think. It's a very cool field because of the innovation and for your guys' interests and excitement and thoughts about how can we do this better. And I think, especially at great uh, device institutions like, like here in the Twin Cities and the university, um, with a lot of really good collaboration between physicians and uh, device developers like you guys, it's really kind of exciting and fun to see. We kind of think about it, but we don't know technically how to do it, and, and that's where you guys can come in and help us with that. So really appreciate your t attention. Does anyone, any questions or comments or things you'd like to, to offer? Yeah. How often are patients like visually It's a great question. It can be sometimes the, you can sometimes see it for a day or two, or sometimes it can be up to like a week or so. I mean, it's shockingly, I've seen it sometimes even go beyond a week. And 
Um, obviously, the longer those devices are in, there's risk of infection. And um, literally just before I walked over here, that one I showed you where the sheath wasn't in the artery, I just got a call for somebody who was transferred here on ECMO um, from another hospital and is now starting to kind of recover and the blood pressure is going up. So when they're, they're, the blood pressure is super low, um, sometimes you're not appreciating complications. So they just said, hey, the, the thigh is really expanding. <laughs> like, oh, where do you think the sheath is? <laughs> do you think the sheath is in an artery or is it, in, you know, because you're not worried and not as worried about that. And so that patient just went on and is already having some issues with that. So um, there's uh, just, during the time they're on ECMO, any of these other little things can happen, in addition to all the other medical stuff going on with the patient. Um, but the, the device issues are, are real. And even from when, in the last five years, six years, the cannula size has gone down. So again, from, you know, thanks to you guys, those have gotten even smaller. Because we, when, when I was sort of first dealing with some of this ECMO back in Pennsylvania, sometimes the, the cannulas were being used were like 18, 20, and there's no question you're gonna have problems with the leg. So we've had sometimes issues where, you know, patient survives ECMO, but maybe loses part of their leg or something like that from lack of blood flow. So that's part of the issue is if you can get the cannula smaller, the tubing smaller, then that would mean blood can still flow around it to the leg, and then you wouldn't need to stick this device in the artery lower on the leg. So if you had something that's small enough that could still do the same pumping effect, and that's part of the issue is you know, you need something large bore to get a big volume of blood, but could you do it with something smaller so that you wouldn't um, really kind of erode that femoral artery or block up the flow to the leg? Yeah. So do you customize the size of uh, each of your slots for different patients? For the, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So the companies, there's different sizes. So there's, for the, the, the pant leg one, um, there's lots of different sizes, absolutely. So we get the CAT scan and then we size up. We want to oversize by like 10 to 20% where the seal's going to be on the neck part. And then the, the length too, right? So we look at the length that we need. We also look at when we have to bring that second piece in, um, is where can it enter in is going to be easy because that's the other thing. We have to navigate with a two-dimensional image, kind of navigate the wire into that other open pant leg and believe it or not, sometimes that's hard to do. It seems simple, but it's kind of floating in this sack where there's this, you have a sack that's like this big, and here's this little bullseye you're trying to steer your wire through. And again, you have a two-dimensional image you're looking at. So it's, some people have even thought about like, well, what if you have kind of a magnet, if you could bring a wire around and so that the magnet would capture the wire and pull it up. But um, yeah, all sorts of different sizes, and even for, like we do these um, for rupture, and so the patient comes, we even, where we don't really have a lot of chance to size things up, but we kind of do it on the fly and, and get a, a quick look at size and kind of go from there just to save the life of the patient. But um, uh, all sorts of diameter measurements, length measurements, and then we are at the time of procedure, we will measure again. So for particularly up in the chest, we might say, okay, I know I need this sort of diameter, but Sometimes, you know, when things curve, the length will be eaten up. So something that maybe it looked like it would need a 20 centimeter length, because of the tortuosity, it might make it really conform, and I might need a longer piece. So we have to have some extra available in different sizes. So there's a lot of discussion beforehand, like, what do you think we need? And we often will uh, we'll size it up, and then uh, we talk with the company and say, here's what I think I need. What do you guys think? Um, it's not custom made, but there's lots and lots of pieces that you can make it work. But the, it could be one size bigger diameter, and the other size is smaller. Yeah. So you use one piece or you use two pieces? Yeah, so if the question is if there's one, like the top part is larger and the bottom part is smaller, you have to kind of make a gradual change with that. So usually it's, uh, there are some that are tapered where it's a, um, to, uh, a bigger size on top and a smaller size below, but not a lot because, right, it'd be hard to cone that device down. Um, and have the integrity. So the change from the top diameter, let's say there's some that are 38 up top, but 32 diameter below. Um, if you've got something that's 38 up top and like 20 below, you're gonna have to use different sizes and kind of gradually make the change down. So sometimes that will require more than one piece, which sometimes, you know, that gets expensive. Got to I mean, this, this device, um, you know, the, this is probably $15,000 or so. Um, and so as you, you know, I don't really, 
I shouldn't say this. I don't. Th- I don't want to say I don't think about cost. But sometimes, you know, we're like, God, we gotta. You know, how many pieces do I have to put in? And and it's a it's a big. You know, it's a it's an issue. You have to balance that, I guess, with OR time and the time that you spend in the operating room and the cost of that. But these are are not cheap. Let's just say when somebody opens the package of this, you're like, if you drop that on the floor, <laughs> that's like your car. <laughs> that's the payment for your car. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. So if you ever face it, is a not properly like a wrong place or is it not open properly? Do you fix it? Can you do anything? Yeah. That's the way, you know, what we say, our word on the street in the OR is like experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> and so there's different things you learn where it doesn't open up like you think or, you know, and sometimes it's been failure where one of the companies has like a nose cone type of thing to taper. So this is all packaged and there's kind of a tapered nose cone to help it track. And so sometimes what you have to do is you, there, it opens in stages where you open it up and then you have to kind of unscrew something so that the nose cone goes forward and it releases, especially this one with the barb or the wire up here. So the nose cone will release it. But I had one one time where I was working up in the chest area and the nose cone uh, would not release. So uh, we did lots of different sort of maneuvers. And it's not like you, I mean, you're working from punctures down in the groin. I'm not in the chest or anything. So we did all sorts of like, trying to, you know, jigger it around and, and try to then turn it back and turn it forward and it couldn't, we just couldn't and only once in my, so these have been out since 2005, um, in my now almost 14 years of viewing it, I had to actually call cardiac surgery, we had to open the chest and open the vessel to get that, it was, that was, it was awful. And what can you do? It's, we couldn't get the device out of the body. Um, and that was where, um, you know, we were like, call the company, you're like, hey, <laughs> just FYI, we could not get, you know, it, it was disastrous. But, you know, we got, the, got it done and everything. But the other things that you mentioned, like if something kind of curves or kinks, those are, there's lots of different tricks. Sometimes we'll use balloons for those. And sometimes even if this is, let's say, like this needs to land below the kidney arteries, and if it kind of cre- creeps up or it's close to that, sometimes we can even use a balloon and really inflate it and pull down a little bit and the device will slide a little bit further down. And, and so there's a lot of different tips and tricks um, that people try. And again, sometimes it's just things you've seen over your career. You're like, oh yeah, I saw that one time. And you share amongst your partners, hey, did you ever see do this or try, you know, because this it's not perfect. And, um, and again, the anatomy, sometimes you, even though you look at the a CAT scan a thousand times, and you know, I was like in the shower in the morning. I'm like, okay, how am I gonna, I'm gonna do it this way? And then you get, and the anatomy and the three three dimensional tortuosity and things doesn't work like the model, or do, you think, okay, it's not tracking this way, or it's just you just have to always be prepared and think about like if something goes wrong, what can I do to salvage the situation and have backup. Well, appreciate your attention, and I look forward to you guys. Oh yeah, question. No, before, yeah, the planning is, so the scenario would go, um, I would see a patient um, in the uh, office and, you know, I have somebody coming tomorrow that I've already, I I looked at the images and already, I kind of have an idea like what graft I want to use, what the size is, and then, um, and then I'll, look at it multiple times because sometimes first I'm looking at it for size, then I need to look at, well, is the artery big enough in the groin to pass it through? There's so many little things. Then I come and look at it again, I'm like, well, how much plaque is there in the arteries that might get in my way? Um, <clears throat> and so then I start to look at, well, can I go through the artery? Is that artery too small? Maybe I need to make a little incision and go higher up and go in. Um, and then I, so I'm thinking about all that. Then I see the patient and the guy might say, Oh yeah, well I have a colostomy, or I have all these. I had all these surgeries, or I had this, and then you're like, oh my God, I can't like go over there. And so there's there's the patient issue a bit. You know what they look like on the scan, and then there's their you know what they've had done, and then there's still then when you get to the operating room, sometimes again these you've planned it and you've got the sizes, and you're like, oh that's not going to go. And sometimes it may not pass where you thought it would, and it's, if it's too curved. 
We sometimes will use these stiffer wires, and it actually interestingly kind of straightens the vessels a little bit out, um, so you can pass things. But um, you know, sometimes you still can't pass it. And you got to think of, you know, we tell our trainees, you always got to be thinking like plan. You got your plan A, but you need to have like plan B, C, D. What's your bailout option if it's not going to work? So um, that's where we have different devices, and you know, as I said, we, you know, mo I would say probably. 80 to 90% of the time, we kind of plan it, and that's how it goes. Uh, but sometimes there's things that you just, you kind of see the morning of when you look at it again. You say, oh, I, I'm, hmm, I'm not sure that's going to work that way. And, um, and then sometimes you just have to try it a little bit on the fly if, you've, uh, if your device, if there's a problem with that. It doesn't open like you think. Or um, because sometimes these things are pushed forward, especially for the infrarenal aorta, the, if you have to cross the legs of those graphs sometimes because you can't get in from the other side it's directly AP, you gotta go way out of the side. So some of those things you, you sometimes can't predict very well. Well, thanks for your attention and for staying on such a nice day. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.